you know, I just try to come up with ideas for stuff that excites me and then set out to design it. And yeah. if I'm going to put something out into the world, I feel like it needs to be you know, better than 100%. It needs to be absolutely something that someone will want to use in, in 20 years. So this is actually uh, the, a complete make noise system. It's got all of our modules in it. Uh, when you're building a modular synthesizer, you wouldn't necessarily get one box that kind of had everything you needed in it. You would uh, have to do a little research and look at all the different modules that are out there and pick the ones that you're most excited about and then get yourself a case and uh, install them in that case. So for example, in this, this system here, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, nine different modules. You've got everything uh, from a, a you know, basic VCO here. So that's what you're hearing right now is, uh, is this uh, DPO, it's an analog VCO. It's two, uh, two VCOs, a wave folder, and a bunch of other shaping, uh, shaping circuits that make it sound like more than just a triangle wave. So you can get kind of sweeping textures and whatnot. And the other part of this patch was uh, the phonogene, which is a uh, granular looper. And that's, that's running through the echo foam, which is a, uh, a pitch, shifting, pitch shifting echo. So the phonogene by itself. Sort of hear the remnants of a loop in there. So with the phonogene, you can do a lot of fun stuff. Once you get a loop in there, you can do stuff like play it backwards, change the speed. You can break it up, granularize it. So when you combine the two, you can get build like a you know small composition of sorts so I get rid of all the modulation here for a second and if you uh, this is what we're starting with here it's a basic sine wave right. continuously variable from so low that you can't hear it to really high high enough that you probably don't want to hear it um, and then that sine wave, you can take that and run it through these shaping circuits and it can change how it sounds. Um, one of the shaping circuit circuits is a folder and it takes the, that sine wave and folds it over on itself so that it starts uh, creating harmonics above the, the root note. So there's your, there's your initial root note, right? And as you increase this parameter folds, you can hear the harmonics adding on top of it. So another one of the parameters we have here changes the shape of it. And it goes from, a, uh, from the sine into a, a kind of a spiky wave. That sounds like this. And then it goes into a triangle that has that spike in it. 
And the reason for that, that uh, those selected shapes is because that spike gives your ear something to follow. So if you're playing like a real low kind of sound, that spike is something that uh, the ear can kind of track as a, as a, uh, as a uh, melodic element. Sometimes when stuff gets really low, it's almost hard to tell what note you're playing. That spike will kind of make that note kind of pop out. And then when you start modulating uh, this angle parameter, that's the third parameter that can affect the way it sounds, you can get all sorts of, uh, almost sounds like pulse width modulation. I'll just, I'll just let you hear it. So, uh, it, again, it, it's kind of animating uh, the sound. So you, you, you start with something as simple as that, and then you can get into something as, as complex as and something a little more animated. Something else that shape control does is it can, it can thin out the sound. So sometimes you want a sound that's really heavy. And sometimes you might want a sound that's a little thinner. It's really just about you know, designing something that can kind of go to over all the different uh, timbres that you might want. This can do everything from a real simple, pure sound to a real thin, crusty, dirty sound. The echo phone is, is, not, is not your typical echo. It it's uses an algorithm that Tom, that Tom wrote that takes inspiration from one of the first pitch shifting, time shifting devices that was ever made called the Tempophone, which used analog tape to change the perceived pitch or tempo of the source material. And it did that by having, um, having one record head and then several playback heads. And the playback heads were on a, uh, on a wheel that spun. And the tape would move at one speed, but the playback heads would move at another speed. And so if the tape was moving slower than the playback heads, you would get time stretching. If the tape was moving faster than the playback heads, you'd get time compression. And also you could do pitch shifting with it and all that. So it uses that as a sort of basis for the algorithm. And it definitely has a sound that's unlike your typical digital echo. So we can give it a little whirl here. So the pitch shifter, so there's your, the pitch of the sine wave that's going into it. And then there's the shifted sound. And uh, I don't know if you could hear that, but it's, it's almost a sort of amplitude modulation that's happening. Uh, that's part of the algorithm, and it's because it's constantly, it's constantly fading between two different uh, readback heads, and that's how it achieves the pitch shifting. If you like that, that's great. If you don't like it, you're kind of screwed because it's always going to be there. It's a part of the algorithm, and it's something that we wanted there. It gives it its unique sound. So the pitch shifting has t two different controls. One's called depth, and the other's called pitch. The depth will let you set everything from a deep pitch shifting where it's, it's literally can go from uh, across four octaves, so it can shift up two octaves or down two octaves. But then with depth turned down a little bit, you can get more subtle shifting that's almost like chorusing.
The other thing that it has is a lot of saturation in the feedback path. And so that's why you're getting that kind of crunchiness. So the combination of that, uh, that tempo foam based algorithm for the pitch shifting and all of the saturation that Tom put into the feedback paths really gives it a, a unique sound. It has a, a almost, I hate to use the word when you're talking about something that's DSP based, but it does have an almost analog flavor to it. It definitely doesn't sound digital um, as much as your typical digital delay would. It also has this really cool little uh, feature called freeze, where you can put something into it. And it'll inf re infinite, uh, infinitely repeat. So for example, we could do something like this. And that'll go on forever. But you can do some other fun stuff with it, like... Yeah, it, does, it definitely has... Uh, the guy, the guy that we're working with on this one, Tom, he definitely has a, a, a very good understanding of what makes analog really great. And even though he writes DSP code, I think that that really affects how he writes his DSP code. It, it, because yeah, it's almost, it's crazy how, how much it sounds like something that uses tape or uh, those, that type of technology. But, but it's, it's also not, it's not necessarily a, um, no, I wouldn't call it an emulator because there's a, there's a lot of stuff that it'll do where it really kind of goes beyond those sounds too. Um, and it can definitely sound down, downright gritty and digital. I guess in that way, you could say that, that even when it's frozen, the echo time is still, um, it's still destructive. But the pitch shifting is not destructive, so you can sequence it to your heart's content. So for example, you could grab a sound and, and uh, freeze it and create something interesting by, by uh, modulating the echo time. And then you could patch a sequencer into the, the uh, pitch control input, and that could be your sound source for your, your mel melody. Mm. I don't know what we left up in here. So yeah, that's that, the frozen sound that we just captured. day is the same around here. One day we'll be building stuff all day and the next day we won't build a thing. All of our, our boards are put together out in LA and all of our metal work's done in Ohio. And then the metal work and the boards kind of arrive here and uh, we put them together and do the final assembly, test them, calibrate them if there is anything that needs to be adjusted. Nice. Listen to them, make sure they sound right and then pack them in one of those boxes over there and send them off. Nice. And so when you get one of these, you know, come in a box, you pull it out of the box, and, and uh, as it is now, it won't do anything. So you would take it, and you've got your power connector here, and the first thing you would do, come on over here, is um, 
So this is your power, your power supply. So this is sitting inside the case. And the first thing that you would do is you have to plug it into the power supply, right? And then you would uh, screw it in. You got four screws to install. Then you can turn it on and make some music with it. So what we sell is, is, is literally the pieces that somebody could collect together and build their own custom instrument. So it's, you wouldn't have to do any soldering or anything like that. But you do have to learn a lot about what you're, what you're putting together. There is some general guidelines, but for the most part, you're going to have to sit down and think about it. Well, wh what am I trying to do here? And a lot of times, you'll have an idea, you'll get everything set, set up, and then realize, well, actually, this isn't what I want to do. I think I'm going to swap this out and put this one in, take that one out and put this one in. Maybe that'll be what I want to do. So it definitely takes a little, a little time. I think a lot, of, a lot of the folks that I've talked to over the years, the system they started with two years ago, it, you know, if you look at it now, it doesn't look anything like what they started with because they're constantly shuffling stuff in and out and kind of changing it up. And, that, and that, again, that's, it, for some, that would be a frustrating element, but I think for the people that love it, that is what makes it great, the fact that they can completely change it anytime they want by either repatching it or pulling something out and putting a new circuit in. It's, it's a sort of, it's a continuous process. It's not something that ever really ends. You're always kind of tweaking it and building it and changing it. It's part of the beauty of it.